Some things just never change, and the MLR is back at it again with some more scandal. And rumor mill is not looking good for LA. Let's get into it. Here comes Danny Tuzizawa. Back to Baker. Baker with the fin. Kurt Baker in for DC. And this may well do it. Old Glory with the try. The New Zealand Sevens legend Kurt Baker with the cherry on top. Can you believe it? Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the On the Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Blue Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Naga Ishii, and welcome back. Man, uh, domestic rugby here in the U.S. is not looking so hot. Uh, we had another team dissolve within the last week since our last show. New York has joined Toronto in dissolving as well with no signing since uh, reintroduction. We just had a signing of a U-20 star from the Toronto Arrows Academy signed to the San Diego Legion. Unfortunately, uh, nothing yet of New York. Same thing with Toronto. Seems to be financial issues stemming from uh, not meeting the uh, financial final call to say that they are ready to compete. Hopefully, we see them back next year. I have no idea already uh, by the sounds of it. On most social media channels, they are feeding into other teams. Uh, a lot of these guys, specifically Nick Savetta, uh, Dylan Fawcett, they're all big proponents of the union that's trying to get up. Uh, up started in the u.s so perhaps this would be a driving force for them to get that uh, ball rolling but no real movements on either front on that uh thankfully the mlr is offering a dispersal draft for better or for worse um i think that the draft really incentivizes a lot of teams to pick up more of these players there was a lot of salary cap considerations given the fact uh of the fire sales happening through numerous teams, whether it's from Seattle, Houston, San Diego, uh, Old Glory giving up a couple players. You, you, the list goes on and on, and I think the way they devised it is effective, but um, more of a consolation prize than anything towards the athletes and their families. Um, break down the draft. It will be happening on Wednesday the 13th. This is being recorded on Monday, December 11th, so two days from now. The order will be in reverse order from the MLR draft. So best teams go first. Um, specifically for New England, they would have the first pick. Uh, those who opt in will do not count against the cap for 2024. I think that is huge to incentivize more player movement around the league. Hopefully that will allow for you know, a few of these clubs who are a little bit more upstart, You know, maybe not a San Diego, a Houston, or a Seattle, or even a Utah to kind of uh, easier uh, – move some salary to, you know, maybe help with housing or help get people uh, start on their feet first before the season starts. I think that's going to be huge in terms of showing good faith to the players, uh, given the lack of transparency on that regard. Um, and those who do not get drafted will be able to sign with any team. Obviously, those who get drafted can start immediately with negotiations but are not held to that deal. So sounds a little bit like what happened with Chicago. So see what happens with that uh i definitely think like i said it, it's an improvement and a step in the right direction but there needs to be more steps in that regard to help better a lot of the population around the world especially in here in the united states uh, as to showing that rugby is here to stay and that it is going to be a uh not another dying leagues for example with pro rugby or with the uh you know couple of upstarts from like american football you got the xfl the usfl which is constantly collapsing constantly folding and it seems only the case here uh i definitely think that the league currently right now is in a liquidity crisis in terms of their financials you know obviously with everything talked about last week with the leaks to the guardian that's obviously cannot be overstated uh you know from debt collection to unable to play for medical care or retirement funding in you know it's the list goes on and on. A lot of things need to be done. Obviously, you know, you can't expect a lot from an upstart league with very limited budget. And as I've talked about prior, media rights is king in the modern sports world. You know, that's why a lot of uh, conferences realign. That's why a lot of teams are moving players around. That's why a lot of these big signings like Lionel Messi to uh, Miami happens. You know, you, you have these big deals. You have capital coming in and you have butts in seats. And unfortunately, the MLR does not meet either of those. Uh, I definitely see it growing, but obviously there's outside of, say, 
San Diego, Seattle, definitely Utah, formerly Toronto and Houston. You really don't have a lot of uh, diehards in the seats on every occasion. A lot of these uh, stadiums do look relatively empty. Uh, obviously, you know, we can't expect a lot, you know, I'd be happy to see 2,500 to 5,000, but you know, I guess the league can't really even fit that, uh, despite the great, um, uh, strides that places like rugby now and, uh, the MLR shop is constantly, you know, spitting out new ventures in that regard, uh, especially with same day delivery, which is clutch. Um, Obviously, merch isn't really moving that well other than at game day, which is huge. I, I love going to MLR game day uh, when they had the Giltinis here, but, you know, oh, wells uh, on that front. And especially with TV rights, you know, like I said, the biggest king for that. If you look at it, TRN has been free since its inception, which I believe happened in 2019, I think. Don't quote me on that. Maybe 2018. But uh, obviously that was a good uh, step in the right direction to bring in more fans with the f- uh, option that it's free. Uh, you didn't require a cable subscription or anything, but I believe that the uh, push for a subscription model, which should have been done long ago, should have happened earlier. Uh, you know, TRN outside of games at one point, you know, before I even got involved with them, never really had its foot in the door when it comes to a lot of things ranging from, uh, you know, supplemental stuff like shows on the side yes they had the show at stabby uh but we, you need more complementary content and i think that only happened during the covid era and that needed to happen earlier you know obviously with a streaming service you need to have more things available to keep people invested that's what a, a, uh, a lot of the problems are in the modern day with even bigger companies like you know Disney hemorrhaging money, Warner Brothers hemorrhaging money, canceling shows left and right because they can't afford to keep the streaming service running. It's obviously going to hemorrhage money until you can get a constant subscri- uh, subscriber base and not only that, a constant viewership on the platform. And you're not going to get that with a you know service that is not only free but mostly using regional partners. And on top of that, uh, not offering anything on the side outside the game. So. You know, for say for a team that obviously may be in the running for a playoff and gets knocked out, you're gonna lose a lot of that fan base. And um personally, I did see a lot of those ups and downs, those ebbs and flows this year. You know, managing a lot of TRN to give you a little peek under the curtain. I think the most I've ever seen was around forty seven thousand, which is huge. Don't get me wrong, for rugby in America to get that kind of number. But that number could fluctuate down to even like 3,000, 7,000 on a normal day. And uh, and that's with us pumping out articles, having a uh, subscription, uh, or not subscription, but like a streaming partner service, you know, cataloging the New England Free Jacks or the Austin Gilgronies at one point. You know, th- th- there was more options out there and it was still fluctuating. So I think they needed to uh, get more leagues onto this and it was long overdue. I still think they should have... I know they probably didn't have capital for it, though, but to try to beat out, you know, the big players, like what they did for the premiership, beating out NBC for it uh, to get the premiership on or Super Rugby. I think that would have been huge or even to have a rival product like Super Rugby America, you know, just to get a little bit extra money going, you know, maybe for those who want to watch the other comp too, see how it's going. A lot of rugby fans love to watch all the comps and you know a lot of i know a lot of my friends personally we like to watch a lot of europe you know obviously a little super rugby and definitely some mlr but you know things like the league one competition for japan that would have been huge i feel like a lot of people in america domestically want to see these old all blacks and wallabies suit up for the japanese teams and just ball out with like Bowden barrett for like i think he had like eight tries in a game you know yeah it's not the most intense but hey it's something or even like a uh you know, pro duh or something like that, you, you know, just bring some extra money in. I feel like that was long overdue and uh, they're obviously going to struggle in that regard. You know, I always say, yes, you need to upgrade your broadcasting quality, but first you need to get your foot in the ground first, obviously before you help others. Uh, and yeah, it, it's not looking good for the league. I'm not going to say they're going to dissolve, but uh I think it would take a massive exodus, especially from the Eastern Conference, to make that happen. You know, already with all the teams leaving, coming from the Eastern Conference, it's not a good look. Uh, That'll move a lot of what I said in my power rankings last week around. 
I think now, you know, you have to say that Old Glory is the clear favorite to get that second seed. And now you're looking really at just that. I believe it was Miami just to try to push something out there. And, uh, man, you know, Miami's going to have to blow the leg off this league, especially in the Eastern Conference, to get any recognition. Because now a lot of the eyes are going to be on that conference to see where they're going to go and how they're going to attack a lot of the problems that have been unfortunately affecting that side of uh, rugby in America. Um, to carry off about that a little bit, out West, we have problems of our own. A lot of it is in the rumor mill, uh, you know, hearsay, they say, but, you know, I feel like it is good to report on it because for those of us who aren't digging through forums on Reddit or uh, going to regional club matches uh, and talking to people, you know, you hear a lot of things and some of these things are pretty glaring. So we'll go through uh, – each one in turn. Uh, so a lot of the things basically aspiring around that LA may or may not get off the ground. Uh, so while they have released that they have uh, met their financials to play this year, uh, I do believe that uh, financials along with some things in Israel, you know, <clears throat> controversy uh, may or may not be affecting the team's finances, given their connection to the Tel Aviv heat. Uh, that could be an issue that, you know, there has been rumors spiraling all around about, you know, no real living assistance through getting players uh, to come over. You know, a lot of the players are still in ATL or floating around with families. Uh, it was rumored that clubs in LA were trying to grow a funding for that. Uh, specifically, uh, Belmont Shore was kind of a big player in that regard to kind of help get players off the ground to get an academy going. But it seems unsuccessful as it is rumored to only have four or five players uh, signed currently to contract deals, which is not looking good in that regard just to get players and bodies in seats. Uh, obviously, it does not remains to be seen who has been signed of those four or five players. Uh, but not it, it's I, I wouldn't call that an indictment of good health in that regard. Another thing is uh, you would figure that the academy would be created first to try to get uh, more local talent in the door, you know, get relationships with local teams, et cetera. And uh, during a game at UCLA, uh, academy has not been created yet, unfortunately. So there is uh, a problem in that regard. I definitely think you need to build the hype through local clubs to not only promote your team, get bodies in seats, but also to feed the team uh, for future generations of local talent and, you know, that was a big thing that I said that they had to gamble on is to build through, you know, Southern California, Northern California talent, or else you're not going to have the investment that you would, you know, with a lot of players from L.A. venturing to San Diego to go with the Legion, who are definitely one of the more consistent teams uh, in this league and probably one of the more stable presences as of right now, given the current uh, league and climate and environment, you know ranging from whether it's financials to others or even just competing for titles, you know, you're going to go to a place that's going to help you. And, you know, if LA can't do it, someone's going to have to do it. And unfortunately that has been San Diego and really Utah. Um, in that regard, you know, they also have some random things such as uh, there was a report on Reddit. Now this is hearsay, but that uh, LA may not be able to compete in 2024 despite meeting the call due to the fact of the Israel conflict. And I'm pretty sure one of the owners may be donating or whatever it may be to the cause, or perhaps he's infected himself in Israel. Now I won't get political. I'm not gonna, you know, blow the hat off of, what limited audience I do have, but uh, it's not a good look, I think, when uh, you're putting all your money towards a conflict when you have to support families here in the U.S. Uh, on that regard. I definitely think that there are better things that, you know, you have duties to these people that you need to re re resolve, and uh, that should be your priority, I think, at this rate. And despite them having a supposedly very large ownership group with, uh, I believe, only one really associated directly with the Tel Aviv heat, um, that could be called into question moving forward. I would love to see them happen in 2024, um, you know, just to prove me wrong, whether it's with, you know, better play or that the gamble will work out. Because uh, if not, it's not looking great. You know, they haven't even released 
merch, season tickets, let alone a real social media presence, which I think is easy and free. You know, a lot of people in LA, especially associated with rugby or just sports in general, would love to be able to be involved in this team's growth. And I know there are some people in the marketing team trying to make that happen, but no moves yet. And, you know, it's December. A kickoff is in what? Early February? It's you got to start somewhere and uh, it's not looking great. You know, you got to build hype. You People have to know you exist, especially in L.A. I've told people this a million times. They will forget about you if you don't put out a good quality product and you are not uh, relevant, at least in the mindset or hype in that regard in the city. And yeah, to be doing this at the 11th hour is not hot. Uh, so hopes to LA, but uh, not gonna put money on the table to say that they're actually gonna suit up this year. Um, other news across the pond for all my global fans. I know some people were asking me about this on Twitter. Uh, what are my thoughts on Owen Farrell possibly not playing in this? Well, not only not playing the Six Nations, but possibly not playing international rugby at all uh, in the wake of a lot of these social media controversies involving, you know, officiating and r- rugby uh, in general. Um, I guess I can see this from both sides. You know, uh, through the interview with Jamie George that Rugby Pass has done. Uh, you know, uh, the one thing that George did cite was a lot of the social media and fan vitriol, you know, to boo in the stadium and, you know, attack on social media. Now, I see it from both ways. Uh, as a fan perspective, you know, from England, they weren't looking so hot. You know, they did turn it around. And uh, while Farrell did become probably one of the bigger leaders in that unit to get them to that uh, as far as they did, you know, uh, you, you can see it from the fan perspective. Maybe people took it too far for sure. It'd be that way. Uh, another thing would be, you know, fan vitriol in the stadiums. You know, uh, he, he is a very polarizing player. Uh, I definitely see it from the opposing perspective. A, a lot of people, myself included, do think he's a little arrogant, uh, especially with uh, how he plays. Now, he is a very stalwart leader. He's more of a stoic dude. Um, I don't know the guy personally, but he doesn't seem to really – speak out a lot but as uh players on the team have said he is a vocal leader that has changed the team in england uh those of you on that side of the pond can probably more attest to that better than i can uh i used to think owen farrell is a great player until uh he became to me captain soldier uh, shoulder charge um that's definitely one thing i think that he would need to fix in his public appeal is uh you know a lot of people <laughs> probably only really know him from either being a badass in the six nations or you know his uh controversies when it comes to hitting you know a lot of his hits have been pretty egregious you know shoulder charges headbutts spearing and uh, i feel like that needs to change you know while rugby used to be like that you know 10 20 years ago uh same thing with football uh you're not gonna get very far being a outcry to fans and to the medical to public for injuries or thinking that you're a dirty player you know you're he's not thomas lavanini he's not you know shannon frizzell you know beating people up on and off the field <laughs> but uh I, i'm sure he's a decent dude he just you know plays in the heat in the moment but you know that it still comes into question of whether or not you can improve when it's happened multiple years and uh, perhaps he needs to go to tackle school again. Perhaps, you know, Andy Farrell needs to take him to the Ireland camp and kind of rehabilitate, you know, his form because Ireland is a textbook team. But, you know, something has to be done. I respect his decision to step away from it. You know, he's already done a lot for England. I still think he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, I'm not sure if I can agree with Jamie George saying that he's one of the best Englishmen to have ever played in all of sport. Uh I'm sure there's a couple rally drivers, definitely tennis players, maybe some cricket players for all I know uh, that could argue with that. But he's definitely up there with one of the best Englishmen uh, to have ever played not only the game of rugby, but in sport that I know of personally. Uh, So he has his legacy. It's already cemented. We know whether or not you include the dirty hits, quote unquote, or not – He's already there. You know, I'm not saying he should retire, but, you know, you you can kind of see where where it's coming from. And uh, you can't really knock him for that decision, I guess. And 
hopefully we'll see him play, you know, whether it's in the autumn nations or for just in club, uh, you know, still he's a good player on Saracens, but we'll see what happens. Uh, by the sounds of it, if it keeps up this way, maybe the rumor will be correct and he won't play international rugby ever again. And that's, Sad future generations who won't be able to see what Owen Farrell, the good part of Owen Farrell, that what he can do, um, not just the uh, violent clashes. Um, in lighter news on the U.S. front, uh, you know they've uh, Miami has signed Nick Grigg, who is one of the best Scottish players who played for New Zealand uh, back in New Zealand for I believe it was Hawks Bay. That's a huge signing. I think that'll really help their midfield, especially diversifying from that uh, South American talent that they were building in the forward pack. It gives them a little bit of power and not only that wheels to move around laterally uh, left and right, which Nick Grigg brings to the table. Um, along with that, the Legion, I think, killed this signing. They signed Lincoln McClutchy away from Moana Pacifica and away from New Zealand, from Counties Monaco. That is huge. You know, obviously the kid has blown up since his uh, real renaissance in 2020. Uh, he's played with Moana Pacifica pretty effectively you know obviously he didn't get a lot of minutes this year because of christian lately afano basically getting a second prime um i'm really proud for the guy you know i loved seeing him in the brumby uniform um it's great to see him in his old age still balling out for another team especially for in front of his home nation fans but obviously that put lishing mcclutchy down to the bench and uh he was looking like a young star uh, in the making i'm sure the legion and danny lee will be able to develop him uh, as he will be probably be replacing Will Hooley as the starting uh, 10 for the Legion. You know, when you look at it, uh, he fits the scheme perfectly, whether it's through the frantic offloading that they like to do or the wide open play that he runs. Uh, while McClutchy may not be probably the fastest player on the pitch, you know, in comparison to, you know, say a Taranga Rear Waitokia or a Ruita Biddle, you know, he uh, definitely has a nice sneaky fast stride. Uh, he can hit gaps better than most, and he likes to hold his offloads, which I think is important for the Legion because a lot of it, uh, their play is, you know, pass, 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 pass. Whereas him, he'll hold the line until the player is right running down the lane where exactly where he wants it, then boom, it's out. And that has led to a lot of scores, if, especially if you look at his county's campaign in 2020 where he really blew up. A lot of that stems from the, that ability. And he definitely has a great um, off-the-boot field. You know, I'm not going to say he has the big leg like a Jordy Barrett, or, but he definitely has uh, an ability to push the ball downfield with his legs and chip it effectively to not only himself but to others. Uh he had a couple clean ones where he crossed up like four people in uh provincial comp and then kicks it over, uh, crosses it over four people, gets it to the winger and the winger will score down the middle. I thought that was an effective use of his legs. And uh, as a game manager, that's huge to look at from a player standpoint. Uh, I definitely would see his ceiling being as, as a, you know, a fully developed Ruben love. Uh, I think if he develops more of that wheel, and gets more into the attacking standpoint, I definitely think that he could be that flat ball uh, player that the Legion ideally want at 10. But it, uh, obviously he won't have the forward speed of Ruben Love, but he can play 10 and 15. They could easily run him as a biddle and just have him ball out. I'm sure that'll be an interesting conversation with Danny Lee to see where that goes. And I definitely see his floor somewhere along the lines of a Freddie Burns. You know, obviously he's faster than Freddie in most respects, but... Passing, if he continues to work on it, uh, could be up there. And he definitely has, obviously, an international play shown that he has the ability to, you know, be a chipping threat and to be an offloading threat. Exactly what Freddie Burns was for England and was for the Highlanders and most of his uh, term with Leinster. So, you know, there's options there. The Legion are building. Hopefully the MLR doesn't blow up before next year. You know, cross my fingers. A lot of the... Uh, Hounds merch I have will definitely be collector's items too, but uh, that's going to be it for me this week, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. Hopefully I'll see you next week. Peace.